as a particular thanks to the great people who are joining me up here right now. Um, Gail Papp, who is... <laughs> perhaps most importantly, the former director of new play development at the Public Theater. And I cannot tell you the plays that would never have happened without her, but the one that is uh, perhaps most famous in our minds is Normal Heart wouldn't have existed without Gail. <laughs> And Larry Kramer would be the first to say so. She's also a member of the board of directors, and hence my boss. And, and she's also, of course, uh, the wife of uh, the founder of this place, the late Joe Papp. So welcome, Gail. Glad to have you here. And on my right, um, Commissioner Mitchell Silver, who is my landlord, our <laughs> landlord, who is the commissioner of parks here in New York City and has been a stalwart supporter of ours and um, a, a great partner in all of our endeavors. And we're just going to talk for a few minutes about the public, the parks, Shakespeare for the people, and a few other topics like that. But I, I wanted to start, Commissioner Silver, by saying, you know, clearly there's some commonality between what you do as the Commissioner of Parks and what we try to do in the parks. And so you, you have embraced us with such generosity and open-heartedness that you must believe there's a real place for arts and culture in the parks. And I wonder if you could talk about that relationship a little bit. Uh, well, I do. Uh, in the 21st century, parks evolve over time. If you think about, in general, our consumers, previous generations were consumers of goods but the new generation is really consumers of experiences. And that's what our parks and public space should be about. How do we share those experiences with New Yorkers and our visitors? There are some that want to come and see the gardens and enjoy the green space, but there are others that really want to experience their parks. These are the great democratic public spaces, regardless of your income, regardless of your, your race or ethnicity, parks are free. And I believe it's the same thing for arts and culture. We want to make sure we have this great partnership, uh, whether it's public art or it's culture, that people should be able to come to our incredible public spaces, which are open for all, and to enjoy great experiences that they'll remember as long as they live. You could have... That just could have been the public theater's manifesto. We be I mean, we believe in that so completely. The idea that actually that having a commons having a place where everybody comes together and rubs shoulders regardless of race, ethnicity, class, income level, education level, is what makes a city a city. It's what makes a civil society a civil society. You may sleep in your homes and your apartments, but you live in the public space. We want to make sure we have all those experiences because that's where people truly connect and enjoy their lives in our parks and public spaces. It's like he's Jane Jacobs. It's fantastic. I wish I was her son. That would have been great. <laughs> and Commissioner, you were going to ask Gail something, if I remember right. Yes, well, Gail, it's certainly a pleasure to meet you. And my first question, because I don't know if a lot of people know this, but is it true that sanitation trucks were used originally for the mobile theaters? Um, yes, actually, that was true. Uh, back in the early days, when Joe was trying to scrounge up any kind of contributed support, he went to s uh, seven or eight different uh, city agencies asking for help, and he asked for sanitation trucks to pull his mobile theater uh, that he was touring the city with at that time, and he got them. That is absolutely an amazing story. So the success of these productions between 1954 and 61 led Joe and the festival to want to have a permanent home in Central Park. However, there was a conflict between Robert Moses, you can hiss, <laughs> and your husband, Pap. So what, these were really legendary conflicts. Can you share with us your recollection of some of these uh, major challenges back then? Well, it was, uh, it was pretty strong, <laughs> uh, but I think the heart of it was, uh, the best story of this thing is actually in Robert Caro's book about Robert Moses. He has a whole chapter devoted to this contest between my husband and Robert Moses, 
and um, it, it, it had to do with something with personality. Uh, but the way Caro interprets it is that Moses was very dedicated to his second in command, who just couldn't stand Joe. He just hated him. Uh, and uh, he was sort of torn by his admiration for Joe, and I think he kind of liked him, actually, uh, and being faithful to his second in command. So he backed up a lot of horrible uh, activities and attitudes for a while. And then he changed, and I think you'd have to say that uh, we owe the Delacorte Theater to Robert Moses, because after Joe, Joe sued him and won in it. <laughs> And Moses kicked Joe out of Central Park because he wouldn't charge admission. That's the simplest rendition of this very long story. And uh, after that, uh, it went to the state appellate court, and uh, Joe won. He'd been defeated in the lower court, but he won in the state appellate court. And uh, Moses immediately turned around, and instead of uh, opposing him, asked the city for money to build a permanent theater. So that was an amazing uh, reversal of fortune. Uh, and also the whole controversy that went on for months and months in the press put Joe on the map. I mean, th the idea of free Shakespeare just became a rallying call. And uh, he used to say that it was pr probably the luckiest thing that ever happened to him. <laughs> uh, so. That was an interesting relationship. They never met, they never even spoke. Uh, Moses refused to do anything except through correspondence. So um, this idea of a David versus Goliath controversy was partly legend, I think. And uh, I, I think that Carol's analysis of it is probably the best one that I've read. After hearing some of the performances tonight, what we hear, how we feel, and how those performances can change lives, we thank you for your husband's perseverance. We truly oh, do. Oh, well, I do, I do too. <laughs> so now, let's listen to Joe Papp speaking at the opening of the Delacorte Theater. The existence of this theater has many uh, ramifications many important considerations. But one of the most important, I think, is that it is a uh, tribute to democracy. It's a dramatization of a city government's response to the will of its people. In the process of its evolution, we had recourse to every piece of democratic machinery. The courts, <laughs> the, the press, petitions, citizens' committees, et al. All these joined in the struggle to keep Shakespeare free in Central Park. The fact that it is free is key to the understanding of the significance of the festival. Because by keeping it free, I feel we have supported and defended the very core of the, the democratic philosophy, which is the greatest good for the greatest number. And, you know, listen to that, listen to Gail, maybe you understand why I consider myself the luckiest boy ever born in Minnesota <laughs> to be able to sit in Joe's chair because this is a theater that there's absolutely no gap between what it stands for and what I believe in. It's just extraordinary. This theater is based on the idea of democracy. And um, I'm not gonna bore you with my speech about how theater and democracy were born together in the same city, in the same decade on the shores of the Aegean. Uh, 2,500 years ago. That's the capsule version of the speech. Um, but it's, it's, it's what I have always believed, that actually theater is the particular art form of democracy. 
because it implies equality, it implies community, and it implies that the truth is not the possession of anyone. The truth is to be found in the argument between different sides. You know, as soon as you believe that actually in drama that's based on conflict, somebody isn't right and somebody's wrong, it's in the conflict that the truth emerges. And you have to believe that if you believe in democracy. Otherwise, you're basically just using democracy as a cover, as a shield. You really believe you're right, and that if you can take over, you'll make everything right. You don't believe in democracy, but the theater does believe in democracy. It doesn't believe that any single one of those people on stage knows the truth. It believes that only by talking to each other are we going to discover what the truth is. Um, so I managed to slip in the speech. I know. I'm sorry. Um, but, Commissioner, you, you are in charge of the parks of New York City, not just Central Park, but all the parks and all the boroughs. And I know you're a planner. You're not just an executive. So when you look at these parks and you look at what you want to do for the future, what are you thinking about? What are you planning? We already discussed really building an experience for our, our users. I don't just want to be a park, uh, build parks, I want to be an experience builder. We're working with our staff to make sure each and every park reflects the needs of the local community. Uh, but more importantly, I took this job because of one simple word, it's called equity. And when I use the term equity, it means fairness. Are we fair about how we care for our parks in each and every neighborhood in the city, the resources that we provide? And so we did an analysis in our city to find out how much have we, what, how many parks in our city receive less than a quarter of a million dollars over two decades? And it turns out there are well over 100. These parks and families and seniors, they were hiding in plain sight. So our first mission was to make sure that these neighborhoods, these communities would get the resources that they need so that they too can have their town commons to connect, to play, uh, to age gracefully in the parks. And so equity became critically important, but we also knew we needed something else, and that was the arts and culture. And so what I love working with the public through these mobile units is that we're able to bring these incredible experiences to people who may never have been exposed to Shakespeare and other performances, and we all know that lives will be changed in those rooms when they see those performances. I was moved this evening from hearing the performances Park's about creating memories, and we want to work together to make sure we create those memories for present and future generations. And so having equity at the top of the list, making sure that all New Yorkers, regardless of the neighborhood, can enjoy the incredible experience for free is something that's so important both to me <laughs> and this administration. Absolutely. I don't have a chance to vote for you tomorrow, do uh, I? <laughs> <laughs> There's always 2020. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> so, as your landlord, Oscar, can you really tell us how the public manifests its mission uh, over the course of the years? Yeah, I, uh, I can try to, but I'm going to focus on one specific thing because you've just inspired me talking about equity. All right. We, you know, Free Shakespeare in the Park is the jewel in our crown, it was the founding thing that we did, and it remains the most visible and important manifestation of our mission. I've sometimes said that if you just take the words, free Shakespeare in the park, you can unpack everything about the public theater. Free means that we're committed to being accessible to everybody. Shakespeare means we're committed to doing the best work, the most excellent work. We're not doing, as Merle Dubusky said during the course of the great conflict between um, Bob Moses and Joe Papp, at one point there was some internal discussion of maybe we should charge. And Merle looked at Joe and said, Joe, I will work for free Shakespeare. I won't work for cheap Shakespeare. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's the perfect encapsulation. We're not just doing free stuff. We're doing the best stuff for free. You're seeing Shakespeare for free. You're seeing Meryl Streep for free. You're seeing James Earl Jones and Jeffrey Wright and Liev Schreiber, and I could go on and on. You are seeing the best that America and the English language has to offer for free. And in the park means that we're committed to the public mission of the theater. Which, you know, One of the things that Joe believed was the theater had something to offer to the great discussions of our time. 
when we're debating the issues of our time, when we're debating immigration, don't you want to see Hamilton? When we're debating gay rights, don't you want to see Normal Heart in, or Fun Home? In other words, that there is something the theater can provide. Um, our, our friend Samantha Power, who's ambassador to the UN, has started taking groups of ambassadors here to see our shows um, because she finds it very useful. She took the entire Security Council to see Hamilton down here. The Russian ambassador didn't like it. Um, so, so far, him and Michael Riedel are the only two people we can find. Um, but the, other th the story that she told me is that she had taken a whole group of ambassadors to see Fun Home up on Broadway. And she hadn't told them what it was in advance. And many of the ambassadors were from countries that had terrible anti-gay laws. Some of them executed gay people for being gay. And she took them to Fun Home. And it happened to be the week before Orlando. And after Orlando, for the first time in the Security Council's history, Samantha got a unanimous resolution of the Security Council against anti-gay violence. Against, against violence against gays and lesbians and bisexuals. And, and you just look at it and you go, oh, oh, that actually happened because of a piece of theater. And she's convinced it is. That what happens is how can, when you're seeing a person on stage, how can you continue to think of them as an object when you've empathized with them, when you've cared about them? And anyway, so the... I have, as your landlord, I have one more question for you. <laughs> So, uh, very quickly, the sanitation trucks are gone. Robert Moses is gone. Can you tell us about how you have transformed the mobile unit for which the entire city is able to benefit? Because this, in my opinion, is an incredible equity mission that fits right into what we're trying to do in our parks. Thank you, Commissioner. You got me right back on track. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, listen, the Shakespeare in the Free Shakespeare in the Park at the Delacorte, we are victims of our own success. It is one of the most popular things in New York City to go do, which means that this program that was founded entirely about access has become one of the hardest tickets to get in the city of New York. We removed the economic barriers to seeing the shows, but, I mean, really, how many people are capable of waiting in line overnight in Central Park to get a ticket? So what we knew is precisely because of that success, we had to take ameliorative action. And as usual, when you're at an institution as great as the public, you can fix things just by looking back and going, well, you know, we started, Joe started doing this as a mobile unit. Let's do it again. Let's revive it. Let's go to where the people are. So five years ago, we revived the mobile unit. And as Ariel was telling you, we go to uh, prisons, homeless shelters, parks, around the five boroughs. And then we discover, and they're fantastic shows. Um, and I could spend the rest of the night telling great stories about the interaction with incarcerated audiences, which frankly make most of us think, why are we doing anything else? Because when you're performing for incarcerated people, what you discover in an absolutely visceral way is this work is needed. It's like food and water. People need to see themselves in stories that connect themselves to the world. And it's, it's beautiful. But what we also did, because Patrick runs this place, and he's really smart, we did metrics. And the metrics for our audience proved that we have got diversity in our audiences, in all, both in the park, down here, in the pub. But the only place where those metrics actually match the demographics of the city of New York are in the mobile unit. And it's just, it's clear as can be. If you want to reach all the people, you got to go to the people. And so under the extraordinary leadership of Stephanie Ibarra, we have revived the mobile, we are increasing our support of the mobile, and we will be doubling down into the future on the mobile because that's how in 2016 we can really achieve the mission. Um, and now it's, uh, my, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna walk a little bit downstage and thank Gail Papp, and Commissioner Mitchell Silva. Please thank them for joining us.